Glad to see you back so quickly after the coffee break. You know, we are a little bit authoritarian about timekeeping at this conference. Um, I'm happy, very happy, to introduce our next speaker, Professor Gabriela Cruz. She's a professor of music um, at the School of Music, Theatre and Dance of the University of Michigan in the United States. She focuses in her research on 19th century music, mostly opera, and on the use of technology in relation to that. In 2020, she published a book, this book, if you don't have it, order it today. Um, it was like a gift from heaven for me personally, coming uh, into my mailbox in the middle of a pandemic. It's called Grand Illusion, Phantasmagoria in 19th Century Opera. So you probably share my enthusiasm. Um, it's, so it is a book on, on the history of the Grand Opera and on how the Phantasmagoria or the Lantern uh, added to the spectacle that was actually crucial to the genre. And it was also one of the major attractions uh, to the audience. In the book, Gabriella combines like musical analysis with a study of modern technologies. And in, she does this so to show how the Phantasmagoria and by extension the use of gaslight uh, evoked the dreams and ghosts uh, of the characters, of the opera characters on the big stage. And this in an era of profound uh, transformation of the opera and the grand opera in particular. So I am very happy that Gabriella has agreed to join us here today. And she will give a uh, lecture. You see the title there. I will not repeat it. Um, and we will have time for questions afterwards. Gabriella. Thank you very much. Um, you know, all life is always much more interesting when one steps away from what one knows, of course. Uh, but let me tell you that as a musicologist being here, it's quite amazing. <laughs> Um, it's I, this conference, I, it's already began being eye-opening to me. And, you know, any event on Magic Lantern would be eye-opening, I, I gather, but, uh, but in a very provocative and fresh and exciting way, uh, I'm learning a lot. Uh, I would not be standing here, was it not for the very extraordinarily kind uh, invitation of Lean and of the Be Magic team, and I want to thank Thank you for thinking of me. Uh, musicologists, as you know, are not particularly known for their visual acumen. And so I think that having me here, it's a bit of a brave choice for you. But <laughs> um, let's start. So today, the magic lantern is commonly, as, in, as we all know, inaccurately remembered as um, remembered as a quaint technology for producing moving or changing images of forerunner of silent film. This is in contrast with the stupendous reputation it enjoyed during the 19th century. The Magic Lantern and the charismatic show of Phantasmagoria it produced was invoked by Karl Marx to describe the power yielded by the commodity over the modern subject and decades later with Walter Benjamin, it became a metaphor for the experience of capitalism to court. And this is not the only conceptual use of 19th century subjects found for the machine. The magic lantern has been described as a mechanism particularly adept at explaining the operations of perception, the workings of the imagination, and the powers of the aesthetic. Its optical mechanism was even mobilized in the contemplation of those domains of experience of listening or singing, which were ostensibly alien to the visual operations or peripheral to its order of the visible of the, this machine. Inescapably, this now archaic apparatus of visual projection finds itself at the center of this talk about how romantic artistic media conspired to have us envision sound and listening in light of a modern regime of vision constituted under the influence of the magic lantern. This paper considers the labors of the imagination which brought the sonic domain into the fold of the magic lantern and which transformed sound and singing into key elements of the modern experience. 
The magic lantern is a medium of suggestion, and it is this capacity of the apparatus that I want to harness for my own transmedial conversation here. And this is a conversation about visual and sonic trickery inspired by the lantern in early film, in 19th century novella and opera. So scene one, trickery in the nursery, circa 1903. We are in the interesting domain of Georges Méliès' moving images. Here there is no voice, and yet the screen exudes musicality. As is the rule in silent film, the movement we are about to see is choreographed to real music played on the film set. In this case, uh, the visual choreography is anchored by a rhythmic pattern, long, long, short, short, long, so ta, 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 uh, that is uh, the, consistent with the duple meter of the polka. Bam, bam, ba, di, da, 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 bam, ba, di, da. That's, you get the reference here. Short, short, long, short, long, long, short, short. And I'm purposefully depriving you of the sonic component of this, of this show. Uh, so uh, we are at a nursery circa 1900. We see balls, soldiers, a jack-in-the-box, a picture, a rabbit, and a few other things. Really the kind of things we would expect to find in a playroom. Two figures move about happily. We recognize them immediately. They are Arlequin and Pierrot. These two fellows, the anti-heroes of Comedia dell'arte, are at home in the world of toys at the turn of the century. The conceit is obvious. Millier's cinema is substituting itself to um, the imagination of a child, that is, to the kind of imagination able to bring toys to life. Arlequin, the trickster, and Pierrot, his poetic patsy, get busy. From parts they find propped against the wall, they assemble a box. This box becomes a magic lantern at first, then a magician's box later, and we're going to be looking only at the magic lantern part. The lantern is much bigger than uh, Arlequin and Pierrot. Indeed, indeed, the proportions are all right only for the skewed world of toys, where even small, a small toy lantern is bigger than a hand-sized doll. And we continue. Okay, the tiny operators of the machine seem undaunted. They are, after all, Zani, the servants and factota of the Comedia, creatures able to do anything. The roles assign themselves. Arlequin, the trickster, is the operator of the machine. Pierrot, the naive go-along, the spectator. Illusion, we know, is a play à deux. The show begins. Arlequin takes off the lid of the eye of the camera, and Pierrot sees a young couple dressed in 18th century fashion, signing love to each other. Their manner is passionate, their bearing genteel, they are delightful. Then the pair fades away, and an old couple takes their place. These newcomers are common, uncouth, and they argue vociferously. Let us begin with the obvious. This magic lantern show is a fake. 
instead of the illusion of movement of the real lantern, we see the smooth, uninterrupted register of film. Why is cinema posing as magic lanternism? To satisfy the old rule that the new medium, in order to establish itself, needs to prove itself in the role of the old one, perhaps. Here, film substitutes itself to the magic lantern in delivering a host of expected pleasures. First, the access to what is inaccessible. Posing as magic lanternism, the little film seen by Pierrot builds itself as a kind of television, fernsehen, an instrument to see far. But immediately, it toys with our own expectations. To the question of what lies in the past, it replies tongue-in-cheek, producing figures of youth and of old age, of bliss and discontentment. We get the message, nothing is permanent, especially when illuminated by the lantern or by its film substitute. The apparatus dissolves affect and manners as efficiently as it dissolves images. It twists the imagination, inviting an another mobile engagement with the world beyond. Oh, no, this is not... Uh, no, uh, sorry. Okay, so I, there, this comes with music, I suppose. Uh, uh, where is... And I had taken the sound up because it's not a polka. <laughs> and I don't like it. <laughs> By having conjured a scene of yonder, the fake lantern now draws Pierrot's and our attention in a new direction. Pierrot continues to stare at the screen, but to his surprise, he no longer sees far. What he sees is close up, himself. Then he sees Arlequin as well. Pierrot's awe is its own spectacle. And in enjoying it doubly on screen and on the screen on screen, we might forget that the encounter with the self is, by the time Méliès composes his Lanterne Magique, one of the most venerable tropes of magic lanternism. The practice of conjuring the image of the spectator on the screen goes back a long time in Phantasmagoria to at least to the shows of Paul Philidor, Phantasmagoriste extraordinaire, active in Paris between 1792 and 1793. In revolutionary Paris, Philidor's Phantasmagorias made visible what was inaccessible and very far, ghosts, the past, the realm of spirits. Yet, the most astonishing part of his act drew on what was close at hand. We know this in part because one of Philidor's enthusiastic spectators wrote with amazement in 1793, I saw my own image. I saw myself going, coming, moving before my own eyes. End quote. Pierrot, the spectator, might have uttered the same words. From an instrument to see far, the lantern becomes something else, a new kind of philosophical toy. This toy, vaunted for its Political, revolutionary political potential in Paris during the revolutionary years. And I'll remind you, one of the virtues of Phantasmagoria was to free us from superstition, as one Republican uh, spectator claim on Philidor's shows. For another spectator, it clarified the senseless, of, the senseless uh, revolutionary reality that was seen on the street. And this was another, another testimony at the time. But this, this magic lantern, before, beyond being vaunted for all these capacities, it also threw sand into the classical machinery of epistemology. How so? Méliès offers a bare-bones demonstration of how the projection of the self on screen complicates a rationalist understanding of perception. Pierrot, the intentional spectator, encounters Pierrot, the object while Pierrot, the object, performs the act of spectating. At stake here is the gaze, 
Pierrot's stare. It detaches itself from the eye of the doll and phantom-like travels along an improbable feedback loop. Now, Pierrot looks out only to discover that he is a stranger to himself. He becomes the object of his own gaze. This discovery upends the notion of the intentional subject mastering the object impartially and dispassionately by gazing out from a fixed point, i.e. the Cartesian hypothesis. In the late 18th century already, the magic lantern demonstrates the need for a new theory of perception and hence of knowledge. It will take the discipline of philosophy over a hundred years to come to terms with the lessons delivered by the apparatus. In 1903, as Méliès assembles his Lanterne Magique, the edifice of thought that brings epistemology to a place of the imagination compatible with that of the lantern, what the lantern demonstrates is still in the making. This edifice is built insight upon insight, argument upon argument in the writer, writings of Roussel, Merleau-Ponty, Heidegger, and others. Slowly and surely, they wrestle philosophical discourse from the limitations of Cartesian dualism, the principal distinction between mind and body, res cogitans and res extensi. And it endows the subjects with a new mobility and plasticity. The magic lantern delivers two fundamental provocations to the modern imagination. The first provocation, Pierrot sees himself. He becomes a doppelganger. Remember, the word doppelganger is coined in 1796 by Jean-Paul, who writes sententiously that so are named those who see themselves. So heißen Leute, die sich selber sehen. Pierrot, the doppelganger, finds himself on uncertain perceptual ground. The body and face he inhabits, he sees as something else, something akin to the mask, something material, cold, alien to himself, and yet moving, acting as he does. Pierrot, in other words, perceives a just position of life and death. This is reason enough to shudder or to laugh, as Henri Bergson invites us to do when he describes a kind of comic theater which, quote, combines events in a way that insinuates a mechanism in the external forms of life, end quote. All this is, of course, at play in Méliès' narrative. Pierrot might be a doll, unsuspecting of his own mechanical nature, or perhaps he's a person who imagines himself a doll. It doesn't quite matter, because the question here is not about being. It is about imagining and perceiving. The second provocation issuing from the lantern concerns the nature of vision and consequently of spectatorship. The classical Cartesian subject sees outwardly and into the world and he converts what he apprehends into his mental property. This paradigm of perception and knowledge entails an assertion of mastery over the world around which is imperiled by what the magic lantern demonstrates, that for each instance of looking outward, there is another in the inward direction. Magic lantern entertainments of the kind Arlequin makes available to Pierrot, and on this point it does not really matter if this particular show is delivered by the old medium of the magic lantern or by the new medium of film, these events redefine human attention as mobile and two-directional, the precise sort of attention which becomes a vector for a new sense of vulnerable play. Notice, finally, that the scene in which Pierrot sees himself seeing Pierrot is structured by an inverted relation, a chiasm. This chiasm arises from uh, two conflicting desires, the desire to see and the desire to be seen. This is the source of Pierrot's unstable position as he oscillates between active and passive apprehension. He looks out towards the screen to see far, into the distance, into the past, into something else, and discovers the thrill or displeasure or even the surprise of being seen. 150 years or so after Philidor's Phantasmagoria staged the instability of desire 
animating the spectating gaze, the notion of an inverted relationship became foundational to Jacques Lacan's philosophical account of the gaze. Lacan notes that this very chiasm, quote, affects anything that is inscribed in the register of the scopic drive, end quote. It constitutes the visual field itself. So, the magic lantern redefines visibility. It plays with the idea that the gaze may not reside in the eye, but may move freely around, mimicking the feedback loop, linking the eye of the lantern to the eye visible on the screen. This, of course, is also the promise of film, of cinema, continuously disciplined, curtailed, but also extended, teased, and thematized in cinema. Yet film is a relatively newcomer to the play field of the imagination reshaped by, the visual, by visual illusionism. My purpose here is to draw attention to the ways in which this precise insight into the mobility of perception animates the imagination well before cinema comes into its own. I pursue this subject by considering one single thread, the imagining of a singing voice in the novella of Itihe Hoffmann's Rat Crespel and Offenbach's Le Conte d'Offmann. The story of the voice reconceived in light of the lantern is also one of the emergence of a new aesthetic, which for lack of a better word, I will term here bourgeois surrealism. So, scene two, the bourgeois surreal circa 1808, 1818, sorry. Councillor Crespel was one of the strangest, oddest men I ever met in my life. When I went to live in H, for a time the whole town was full of talk about him. Thus begins Hittier Hoffman's novella, Rat Crespel of 1818. The person speaking is Theodore, the narrator, occasional visitor to the city of H. Soon the same Theodore meets Crespel. His Description of the counselor's body, mind, and voice could not be more outlandish or indebted to mechanism. Crespel's body. Anything more strange and fantastic than Crespel's behavior, it would be impossible to find. He was so stiff and awkward in his movements that he looked every moment as if he would run up against something or do some damage. His mind. Seizing up again and again on an idea, he gave all sorts of wonderful twists and turns and couldn't get back to the ordinary track until someone took hold of his fancy. His voice. Sometimes his voice was rough and harsh and screeching, and sometimes it was low and drawling and singing. But at no time did it harmonize with what he was talking about. Hespel, described by Theodore, is in no way resembles the self-transparent intentional subject. He is in, instead a visible and sonic presence assembled from a variety of images, stiff, run-up, repetitions sizing up again and again, and qualities screeching and singing, an assembly of pictures that could well be painted for and projected by a creaky machine. Thus, Theodore's story unfolds in the manner of a picture book as a sequence of scenes witnessed or remembered, more or less disconnected in time and space, and which, in fact, flatten out the two dimensions of storytelling, the dimension of time and space. Theodore, we might surmise, thinks in images in a way akin to the magic lantern. This is another way of saying that Theodore is a symptom of Hoffman's well-documented fascination with the work of magic lanterns. Theodore's visualism is in some ways ostensible. Here is an account of how he remembers Antonia, the daughter of Crespel, and she's a very important character for us. Completely upset, I went away from H, but as usual in some such cases, the brilliant colors of the picture of my fancy faded, and the recollection of Antonia as well as Antonia's singing, which I had never heard, often fell upon my heart like a soft, faint, trembling light, comforting me. The mechanisms of lanternism, the brilliant colors of the picture, the faint trembling light, are inescapable here. 
And Theodore returns to a kind of overdetermined visuality at other points of the narrative. For instance, he describes the sight of Antonia's emoting as if it was a trick produced by an alternation of painted slides. At first sight, Antonia did not make a strong impression. But soon, I found it impossible to tear myself away from her blue eyes, her sweet rosy lips, her an uncommonly graceful, lovely form. She was very pale, but a shrewd remark or a merry sally would call up a winning smile on her face and suffice her cheeks with a deep burnishing flush, which, however, soon faded away to a faint rosy glow. The spectacle of the magic lantern and of its more fearsome cousin, the phantasmagoria, are adorned by sound effects. Sounds occupy the periphery of the new visual marvelous, and yet these shows are also animated at their core by a preoccupation with voice. The ultimate ambition of the phantasmagorist tells us Etienne Robertson, perhaps the famous, the greatest phantasmagorist of them all, was, quote, to make ghosts speak. And while that never proved entirely possible, the story of Phantasmagoria attests to a great variety of stratagems and subterfuges to generate the impression of a ghostly vocality, words uttered by hidden speakers, the employment of ventriloquists, the invention of amplification systems issuing from separate chambers, and much more. The point is that the magic lantern generates a soundless horizon, a world devoid of voice. This, in turn, invites a supplement, the added voice that covers for the absence installed at the core of the phantasmagorical perception. And yet, paradoxically, the, the difference of the new voice, its fabricated nature, does not so much hide the constitutive silence at the heart of the mechanism as it highlights it. The incorporeal voice, a voice without grain or without throat, as an early observer of Phantasmagoria, Augustus Crucius, a professor of theology in Leipzig, uh, he uses this, this term, uh, a voice without throat, in 1774. So, this incorporeal voice draws attention to the deficit of life. In this, it performs a role equivalent to the mask, the instrument of presence, at a deficit. Hat Crespel doubles down on this paradoxical economy of the voice as mask. Antonia, we are told, has a beautiful singing voice, really an extraordinary voice, crucially uh, not inherited from her mother. And this is important in a longer version of this paper that will happen some other time. But, so Theodore reports, Antonia's voice was a very remarkable, remarkable and altogether peculiar timbre. At one time, it was like the singing of an Aeolian harp. At another, like the warbled gush of the nightingale, it seems as if there was no room for such notes in the human breast. Here, it is the sonic quality of the voice that matters. Antonia's singing builds on the notion of the incorporeal utterance. This voice, Hoffman tells us, is like the warbled gush of the, night, of the nightingale and the sighing of the Aeolian harp. These are clues to another enigmatic musicality, an intentional, passive, mysteriously wrangled out of nature incommensurable with the human body. The nightingale does not know that it sings or what it sings. It does not have a theory of song. It sings out of instinct and perhaps even without intention. Although I think bird behaviorists would argue against what I'm saying, so don't, don't take it as a fact. The Aeolian harp speaks for a musicality even more remote and nearly automatic. The music of the alien harp, produced by the passing of wind over stretched strings, is without want, purpose, as well as without end and reason. Most crucially, it dispenses with human agency. Hoffman considers such music darkly. In Rat Crespel, he extracted from it the idea of a poltergeist, a wind or pneuma, overtaking the chest and ultimately killing Antonia.
Thus, the girl's doctors concludes whether it arises from a too early taxing of her powers of song or whether the fault is nature's enough. Antonia labors under an organic failure of the chest, while it is from that, too, that her voice derives its wonderful power and its singular timbre, which I might almost say transcends the limits of human capacity the capabilities of song. The narrative contemplates the extraordinary song as a problem, a sound phenomenon which the observer cannot square with the human body, its source. Importantly, a movement of return and the possibility of mirroring is written into Hoffman's account of the singing voice. Thus, to, have his, to save his daughter from her own urge to sing, Crespel plays his prized violin, the Cremona violin. The violin becomes the double of Antonia's singing voice. Scarcely had he drawn the first few notes from it, then Antonia cried aloud with joy, Why, it's me, now I shall sing again. Crespel was deeply moved, he played too better than ever, as he ran up and down the scale, playing bold passages with consummate power and expression, she clapped her hands together and cried with delight, I did that well, I did that well. Antonia listening to the violin is like Pierrot observing his own image. She too becomes a doppelganger, the one who hears herself. Her song connects the desire to hear and to be heard intensified in the urge to possess and to be possessed by song. Hoffman's text does more than just keep pace with the magic lantern. It reframes the very lessons learned from the instrument. What the visual apparatus reveals about the conflicting nature of perception and the formation of subjectivity, Hoffman transcribes into a new scenario about listening and singing. Thus, the most striking image of vocality contrived by Hoffman comes at the very end of his novella. This is an image so incredible, indeed phantasmagorical, it is said to emerge in a dream. The counselor fancied, fancied one night that he heard somebody playing the piano in the adjoining room, and he soon made out distinctly that B was flourishing on the instrument in his usual style. He wished to get up, but felt himself held down as if by a dead weight, and lying as if fettered by iron bounds, he was utterly unable to move an inch. Then Antonia's voice was heard singing low and soft. Soon, however, it began to rise and rise in volume until it became a hair-splitting fortissimo. And at length, she passed on to, into a powerful, impressive song, which B had once composed for her in the devotional style of the old masters. Crespel described his condition as being incomprehensible, for, for terrible anguish was mingled with a delight that he had never experienced before. All at once, he was surrounded by a dazzling brightness in which he beheld B and Antonia lo locked in a close embrace and gazing at each other in a rapture of ecstasy. The music of the song and of the pianoforte accompanying it went on without any visible signs that Antonia was singing or that B touched the instrument. Here we have it, then, a new scene of song assembled within the malleable horizon of the dream state and remembered for the radical change in perception it produced. Crispell dreams about singing at first low and soft and then louder and higher. Song becomes to the dreamer, comes to the dreamer in a tremendous crescendo, leading all the way up to a ear-splitting fortissimo. This crescendo indexes the inspiration in magic lantern procedure and effect, translating the phantasmagorical convention of visual magnification into an equivalent idea of sonic amplification. The magnification on screen suggests the approach and coming to presence of an apparition. The amplification in the voice traces the same idea. 
In Phantasmagoria, this crescendo leads us leads to astonishment. Here, it elicits rapt attention rewarded with an ecstatic revelation. The song heard from within the darkness of Chris Bell's dream begets light, a dazzling brightness, an image, the portrait of the composer and the singing gazing at each other. Song generates a haunted field and as such an irresistible one. In Hat Kespel, Hoffman invents a new phantasmagorical dispositive for song. Allow me to conclude by teasing out some of its implications for opera. So scene three, the bourgeois surreal, but this time in 1876. One man, the poet Hoffman, loiters in the vicinity of the theater, waiting for the conclusion of an operatic performance. While he waits, he tells stories. These stories, to be exact, three stories, to be exact, about three women and three songs. First, the story of Olympia, the mechanical doll he foolishly takes for a real girl. Then, Julietta, the Venetian courtesan who, obeying her own mercantile nature, exchanges her song for a soul. And finally, Antonia, the artist who dies from too much singing. These doll-like figures are no more than masks to be played out in the theater by a single singer. We follow their evolutions in three separate acts, and in doing so, we almost forget what, what they are, playthings that are meant to distract us from opera. As Hoffman tells his stories, a real opera performance of Mozart's Don Giovanni is underway in the theater. Yes, Don Giovanni, the story of the rake who evades justice in this world and is made to pay for his sins by a ghost who pulls him to hell. That terrible story. No, we need a distraction, and for that, we could do much better than Jacques Offenbach of Operetta fame, uh, who was justly celebrated for the many distractions he concocted over his lifetime. In Comte d'Offman, his last work, he cleverly plays with the gesture of looking away. Issuing the usual invitation of the phantasmagorist, he urges us to see far away from the adult world of opera we know. We do so and find ourselves in an unexpected or an, in unexpected place, or unexpected place, I'm not sure. The world of childhood, inhabited by dolls that have come to life just like in Méliès's little movie. This magical world, taking us away from the business of opera, is, as promised by the title, a Hoffmannian place, a world of dolls and spirits. Theodore Adorno, the philosopher, has noted this long ago. He writes that the world of Kant, so innocent in appearance, is rather disturbing. Here, writes Adorno, quote, the estranged objects, the dolls, are the spirits trapped in the interiors without access to active life. Distance is nearness. This is a way of saying that Kant is an ontology, a space populated by that which is neither present nor absent, neither dead nor alive, the space of the other. There is not enough time here for us to play with all the dolls or to submit their spirits to proper scrutiny. Therefore, I will set aside Olympia and Julieta, the two better known dolls, and concentrate on Antonia, the artiste, lifted from Hat Crespel. Offenbach's tale of the story follows on a tradition of theatrical adaptation of Hoffman that began in Paris in the 1850s. Here there is a villain, Dr. Miracle, who plots Antonia's doing and dies of singing uh, along with the ghost of her mother. Offenbach imagined that the voice of the mother should issue from a painting as a memento from the past, but we don't have to do the same. For the voice of the ghost is, as we have learned uh, already, mobile and ahistorical. In the staged version that you will see performed in Munich in 2019, and this is just phantasmagorias that I included in the original poster 
of the opera. So in the, the stage version that you'll see that's performed in Munich in 2011, the voice comes out of a modern appliance, the horn of a phonograph about to be invented as Offenbach composes the scene. In the phonograph, voices sounds, voice, the voice sounds dislocated. It comes to us from the future. The voice makes its appeal. Cher enfant, je t'appelle comme autrefois, c'est ta mère, c'est elle, entend sa voix. Dear child, I call you as in former times, it is your mother, it is her, listen to her voice. The voice sounds impulsive, warm, quite here. She issues a very human appeal. Do we trust the appeal? The year of the musicologist detects fabrication, the possibility of a counterfeit. The mother's appeal is open-ended, but her musical embrace is not. It is self-contained, a little musical period in G major unfolding in a closed loop. It begins with a little slow ascend from scale degree three to six for the musicologists in the audience, followed by a downward closing movement uh, that ends in some uh, it's a, a, a tension point and sort of then a weak resolution that is also the return to the song's beginning. You're going to hear it in a second. Like a photographic negative that will yield innumerable reproductions without loss of quality, the little melody could be played ad infinitum. And like a mechanically Reproduce print too. The, the tune is an utterance of neoclassical proportions and cheerful, sunny disposition. This is the song as doll, a commodity. And it will be in a second. song. Okay, so this song is not an original, but, it, but a reproduction, actually. It is what musicologists call the contrafacta, a musical phrase lifted from elsewhere, as it turns out from the overture of Offenbach's little-known operetta Fantasio of 1872. This is instrumental music passing its all, itself as vocal music, a counterfeit. This distraction from opera hints at the future of virtual pleasures, where fabricated signs of emotion will substitute themselves to the real thing. This is the future of cybernetics, of AI, prefigured in the much later film Blade Runner, where cyborgs have memories and dream of sheep or sometimes of unicorns. But we don't want to get lose track of what we have here. The song of the mother of virtual appearance nestles in the voice of Antonia. Then it moves in her, takes possession of her throat and kills the girl. Offenbach stages the gruesome scene like a show of phantasmagoria. Here, Dr. Miracle is the conjurer put, uh, put in charge of the voice of the mother who comes out of the painting or in the version you've just seen of the phonograph. Antonia takes the role of the spectator. She is Pierrot, the witness co-opted by the machine of illusions. The ghost song amplified with each repetition, and here I don't know why the sound just came, there was a diminuendo, but normally there's a crescendo. <laughs> uh, just like a specter produced by, it's just like a specter produced by the machinery of phantasmagoria. Getting louder, it moves towards the ear, then it haunts it. How so? I have already remarked on the sunny quality of the melody enveloping the mother's appeal. Now we will pay attention to the shadow underwriting it. The song of the mother is accompanied, if you notice, by a harp-like accompaniment, this arpeggiation in, in the accompaniment. This harp plays at a simple chord accompaniment 
on the vocal melody, but along with the block chords, an ascending chromatic line, a sort of a step, small step by small step ascent, um, sounds in an inner voice. This persistent upward motion in the inner voice inflects the sunny sense of G major that pervades the song and introduces a shadowy minor progression in a parallel tonality that is G minor, a dark tonality. I want to play the piece again so you can hear it, you can hear the inner voice. inviting you to listen to the maternal song as phantasmagoria. On the one hand, the beautiful portrait of the mother. On the other hand, the mysterious shadow it generates. The song is a bright phantom underwritten by dark musical labors. And, uh, and in the absence of sort of technical description, you all felt, felt this sort of urge in the music, right, becoming more and more tense. And this is what the chromaticism does. The chromatic ascent is suggestive of an invisible hand moving upward with every one of the ghost's notes, which then vanishes at the exact moment in which the invisible hand must be revealed. Labor, usually hidden, haunts the, sound, the song spectacle. Antonia falls under its spell, and so do we. But what attracts us to it is it the bright surface, the chromatic surge beneath it, or something else entirely? The appeal of the mother is always an appeal to memory. And this is why Adorno remarks, quote, the mother's song, an aria from great operas that we carry about us from childhood, born on broad waves, down into the sea of origins, fluorescent with the aura of decay, this is strangely imprecise language for a philosopher, <laughs> even for Adorno. Yet Adorno is right. The mother song is parasitical on the tradition of opera. The song refers to and feeds from the memory of a famous moment in opera, the final trio of Giacomo Meyerbeer's romantic opera, Robert le Diable of 1831. Incidentally, one of the first operas in which one entire scene is inspired by Phantasmagoria. Elsewhere, I have given credit to this trio for inaugurating a new epoch for opera, an era of haunted singing. Now I should confess something else. The first time I've heard Robert's final trio, and for a long time, Robert did not exist as a uh, in. in as an enregistrement, as a recording. So it was you either played it on the, at the piano and sang it and hack it through it or bust. Um, but so when the first recording became available and I heard it, I was haunted by it. It reminded me of something I knew too well but had forgotten. It turned out it reminded me of the song of Antonia's mother. Ghosts circuit, short circuit the best chronologies and tales of origins. In any case, the scene of Robert's final trio is haunted. Literally, in Meyerbeer's finale, Robert is visited upon by the spirit of his mother. She writes a letter to him. He saves his soul because he sings her words. Here, in accordance to early romantic vision of virtue, the maternal prevails. Offenbach sets up the reverberation between the old trio of Robert, Bertrand, and Alice, the mother's voice, and in the new trio of Antonia, Miracle, and the mother, precisely by means of plot. 
in Meyerbeer's opera, The Duke Robert, finds himself torn between allegiance to his father Bertrand, a devil, and loyalty to the memory of his mother. He's saved by his ability to sing his mother's words. In Offenbach, the inverse happens. Antonia is torn between the injunction against song made by her father, and we are about to close, and the musical beckoning of her mother. She succumbs to the second and sings herself to death. The relationship between the two songs is an inverted one, and this is the point, modeled on the askewed relationship of the self to its own image, first modeled by the doppelganger. Offenbach composes this inverted relationship musically. The gentle voice of Robert's mother accented plays out in the music of Offen, uh, plays, uh, Robert plays out in the music of Offenbach. So Offenbach's music deploys this tonal relationship through a process of amplification, illusion, and repression. Antonio's mother begins with a dazzling sound and it unfolds straightforwardly. Um, but it contains the darkness of Meyerbeer. So Meyerbeer's music survives in the tales as a return to the repress in an opera, which is billed to us as a distraction from opera and from its auras. This is perhaps Offman's dream maximized. It is also the work of the Magic Lantern extended well beyond the original circle of pseudoscientific entertainment of Phantasmagoria and transformed into a mechanism of the imagination through which Offenbach now invites us to reprocess the most intimate domains of listening and feeling. In Tales of Hoffman, the work of listening has become that of attending to ghosts, of following their whims, and of understanding that they are no more than projections of our fears. In the process, we learn something about opera, that it can, and by 1876 has already become a mechanism for cannibalizing the musics and voices we adore, our most intimate pleasures. Everything, even the melodies we hold dear, have become objects of exchange, consumption, and substitution. This is nostalgia at work, being shown for what it is, not a thing of nature, but the work of mechanism. As we allow ourselves to be distracted from opera, we enter the world, its world more fully, which is to say, we see it for what it is. And what we see is entirely familiar, a world in which songs that have become things do not possess, but which instead possess us and live in our own dreams. Thank you very much. So the first doll is Olympia, and she's a mechanical doll, and she keeps to time very well. And this is a demonstration that I'm not mechanical, <laughs> because I do not keep to time. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Gabriella, for this inspiring talk. We have a few minutes left uh, for questions. So is there anyone who'd like to start? Yes, Artemis. wondering because I think of Hoffman as a very media, very much kind of a part of this media environment that's almost like industrial revolution part one. Yeah. And you know, there's a kind of a whole mediascape there that includes, you know, the um, femme invisible, yeah. um, you know, and uh, um, Atomica. Yes. Um, of course, and musical Atomica. Yes. Um, and so these are all kind of things that have a just, you know, where, where one would feel a kind of an uncanny disassociation from voice and stuff like that. So I just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts about that. I, I agree. Um, can you, I, can you yeah. rephrase the question? Oh, yes. So the, the question is about this association in opera, right? And in, in Hoffman first and then 
in is it in the opera as well? Yeah. Yeah. That is that is true. Although there is one thing that ties both, and that's the culture of opera. The culture of opera is a culture of uh, memory, right? of not attending to the performance once, but attending many times. And every attendant, er, every listening is a, a dissociated state in which you're always comparing what you're hearing to your favorite performance. And this is, this is something that is the work of melomanie, the work of Meloman that, that often and that Offenbach, do, of, Offenbach does and that Hoffman also does. Uh, as to your question about uh, dissociation in the world of, of Hoffman, Hoffman's literature, right? I agree with you. It's much more obvious in Antonia's case, uh, the, the story of Antonia, which is uh, that Hoffenbach also takes for the first act. Um, but in the case of Antonia, this association is, it, is uh, rewritten differently as a disassociation of voice from nature. That is what he's aiming at. And that is a very radical gesture in 1818. I don't know, as you know. It goes against Rousseau. And if you go against Rousseau, you go against everything that is... <laughs> That is expected, right? I don't know if I'm answering your question in any way. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just think yeah. that I, you know, I do see it as kind of something that, um, you know, is referring is is kind of very much in relation to that ensemble, and that ensemble is kind of, you know, doing a lot of these, not just the phantasmagoria kind of, you know, uh, on its own, but like I mean, because the Fama and the Diva prepared everyone for the phantasmagoria, you know, and the other, I mean, and also that that is true. Right? The, Right. Yeah. Well, what the La Femme Invisible prepares is then a, a different idea of voice, and then it comes to the the question then is what kind of idea, what 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 new voice can we have? And actually, that leads to a real revolution in singing in the 1830s and 40s, where the vo vocal technique changes completely, and people start singing in very different ways, and, and even for a generation, they keep losing their voices because they're trying to do things that they can't do. And one of the things that they're trying to do that they can't do is to sing very loud. They don't have the technique yet. The technique that we have now, the uh, opera singers have now, they didn't have it, and so they kept losing their voices. Uh, but it is precisely that. It opens the, the door of the imagination for what voice will mean if it's decoupled from nature, right? and if it's mediated. Yeah. Thank you. In, in 1881, when it, no, it was not performed by a phonograph, right? Uh, and there's a, a, a varied tradition of how to do it. It's sort of an unstable tradition. We don't have very good evidence of went on on stage in 1881. We have some photographs, and they, there is a photograph of the trio, but it focuses on the three character, on the three singers. It doesn't uh, on the two sing the two singers on stage. It doesn't focus on the on the the portrait, her the singing portrait. So, uh, oftentimes it's 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 produced as a singing portrait. In that uh, in that little that little illustration that I showed you, it is a phantasmagoria on the wall. Um, the point is that it's an unstable. It's a, a, a voice that comes out of an unstable place. The trick in Munich in nineteen in, in two thousand eleven is to place it on the phonograph, and that is suggested of a reading of it, right? Of 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 uh, suggesting that Tales of Hoffman is a really a back to the future kind of narrative, which I agree with, to to a large extent. Uh, but the, the 
the interesting thing, I guess, it's the instability of how to stage that voice. Yeah, yeah, and it can't because it's opera, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> in, well, in this production, uh, of course, the, the voices are, have to be captured, so and it's mixed. So this is a completely different register because it's the register of video. On, in the theater, there's going to be a difference because if a singer sings behind the stage or behind something, you, you're going to hear the difference, right? Um, yeah, and so here we get into another can of worms, which is reproduction and video reproduction. Yeah. Sorry, we will have to conclude this session here. Thank you very much, Gabriella, for this very inspiring talk. And uh, it's not yet announced, but it's time for lunch. <laughs>